Spherical polar coordinates are particularly useful for problems that have some kind of center of symmetry or spherical symmetry about them. And this makes them ideal for uh, things like angular momentum. So what we want to do in this video is explore what the angular momentum operators look like when converted to spherical polar coordinates. Now I've written over here on the right side the uh, definitions that define the spherical polar coordinates. Uh, both going from x, y, and z to r, theta, and phi, and, and vice versa. What we want to do now is to take our three components of angular momentum, so lx, ly, and lz, these are all operators, and uh, see how those look when we express them in spherical polar coordinates. Now I'll remind you that when we write them in terms of the uh, Cartesian coordinates, they look as follows. Lx is uh, I, minus ih bar times the quantity y d d z minus z d d y, and Ly is minus ih bar z d d x minus x d d z and Lz is minus ih bar x d dy minus y d dx. All right, so obviously it's going to require some kind of transformation involving uh, chain rule and partial derivatives. Uh, we're going to skip the formalities and simply get to the punchline here uh, to write these three components in terms of uh, what they would look like in spherical polar coordinates. So our x component would look as follows. Again, it would have a component of minus ih bar. I should note that the h bar here is the units of angular momentum. So, in fact, uh, having that h bar there is what gives this thing the units of angular momentum. Um, but now the ih bar is going to be multiplied by minus sine of phi d d theta minus cotangent of theta cosine of phi times dd phi. The ly component will be minus ih bar. Now this is times cosine of phi times d d theta minus cotangent of theta sine of phi d d phi. The simplest of all of these is the LZ component, so is this going to simply be minus IH bar d d phi? All right, it's particularly simple, and this actually is one of the things that uh, leads us to use this as a special component of angular momentum that we track quite often. All right, now with these three components, we can actually construct the square of the angular momentum. And uh, I'll simply indicate that the square of the angular momentum is the sum of the three components. So it would be Lx squared plus Ly squared plus Lz squared. And that's true in both classical and quantum mechanics. Now, if we were to go through the long, arduous process of doing so, we would find that this in spherical polar coordinates would be equal to the following expression. We'd have 1 over sine of theta d d theta, sine of theta, d d theta, plus 1 over sine squared of theta, d squared, d phi squared. All right, so a nice, uh, fairly compact uh, result. And in fact, uh, I'm going to put a square around this because this is a special result that we're going to want to use uh, quite a few times uh, in the remainder of this module and even beyond. All right, so we've come to a pretty simple expression for L squared here, um, but that may look a little bit familiar, and it should, because that was part of the Laplacian when we wrote the Laplacian in spherical polar coordinates. So if we use this now, let me rewrite what our Hamiltonian would look like in terms of the Laplacian. We'd be minus h bar squared over 2m times the Laplacian plus uh, a term that I'll just call the potential energy operator. And when I write all this out, it's minus h bar squared over 2m. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to rewrite a bunch of stuff uh, that uh, is a big, long, hairy expression. But 
I want you to keep an eye on me and make sure I don't make any mistakes. All right, so that's it. And then, of course, I would have a term for the potential. Now, when we look at this and we compare it to the expression up here, we can see there's a lot of similarities here. And in fact, if I were to move this, uh, well, this first term is an extra, but if I were to move this h bar in to apply to the next couple of terms, and if I were to move the r squared outside, I would end up with something that would enable me to write this Hamiltonian in terms of the angular momentum squared. All right, so let's do that. I'm going to do those operations. So I'll take the Hamiltonian operator now, and I'll first write the term that's just dependent upon derivatives of r. So I'll have 2m r squared d dr r squared d dr. Okay, then I'll have minus 1 over 2mr squared, and I'm going to keep the h-bar separate out here, h-bar squared, and what's left in here? I'll have 1 over sine theta, dd theta, sine theta, dd theta, plus 1 over sine squared theta, d squared, d phi squared. Okay, well, I hope you recognize that this is just the angular momentum squared operator. So in fact, and I didn't write the potential term on here. All right, so in fact, we can write the Hamiltonian as equal to a radial term, which I'll again write down here. Plus one over two, and we'll recognize this is the moment of inertia. So that's one over two i L squared. So you can see that for these kinds of systems, the Hamiltonian now turns out to be a relatively simple looking operator as long as we're comfortable with dealing with angular momentum. And I hope we are because we're going to see a lot more of it in the coming lessons.